वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु In the Bhagavad Gita, we have started chapter three, which deals with action. In fact, the name of chapter three is Karma Yoga. The chapter starts because Arjuna has a doubt, a question, and his question was, "You have spoken to me of two things. One is the path of knowledge; the other one, the path of action." Now. both of them you have praised and it seems to me that enlightenment is possible only by the path of knowledge and yet at the end of it all you tell me to perform action and what kind of action the worst possible action with this war that we are going to fight so which one should i do should i give up action and dedicate myself entirely to the pursuit of enlightenment or should i do this what is in front of me right now tell me one and then sri krishna's answer was loke asmin dvivida anishtha pura prokta maya nagha there are these two paths but you are making a mistake they are not options they are not alternatives not that you can do one uh, and not the other rather they are to be combined one after the other in sequence karma yoga provides you with the necessary preparation for gyana yoga Gyana Yoga is the path of knowledge. Karma Yoga, the path of action. Do the action in front of you. What is in your life right now? Your job, your your duties. Do it, but do it as a spiritual practice. And what is the method of doing that? Karma Yoga. So convert all of your actions into Karma Yoga. Do not give up your actions. Do not give up the, what is in front of you right now. Convert all your activities into spiritual practice into Karma Yoga, and there is a way to do it. and then that prepares the mind for the higher practice of gyana yoga the path of knowledge and that leads to enlightenment so this is a framework i mentioned it last time also the traditional advaita vedanta framework um, karma yoga gives purity of mind chitta shuddhi then um, upasana meditation gives focus of mind ekagrata and with a pure and focused mind when you come to vedanta then vedanta will give you knowledge gyana which removes ignorance ignorance about what our real nature who am i what am i so then then we realize what we are and that is enlightenment that leads to moksha freedom freedom from suffering freedom from samsara so this was krishna's answer and he goes on we have done up to uh, verse number 3 so fourth verse न कर्मण अनारंभा न कर्मण अनारंभा नैष्कर्म्यम पुरुषोष्णुते नैष्कर्म्यम पुरुषोष्णुते न च सन्यासनादेव न च सन्यासनादेव सिद्धि समधिगच्छति सिद्धि समधिगच्छति सो कृष्ण गोज ऑन बाय सेइंग by just giving up action one does not reach perfection enlightenment we are using the words perfection or enlightenment but that's not the word krishna has used the word krishna uses is naishkarmya which is very uh, contextually appropriate it means act- the actionless state by giving up action alone one does not attain to the actionless state and he says even attain is not quite correct ashnute means enjoys one does not enjoy the benefits of enlightenment just by giving up act- activities actions na cha sanyasana deva not just by giving up um, the activities of of life of samsara siddhim samadhi gachati siddhim means uh, perfection realization enlightenment one does not re- reach enlightenment just by sanyasa by giving up sanyasa can mean uh, specifically the monastic life giving up all activities in the samsara or in general it could mean giving up the duties of life just by that one does not reach perfection 
So what does he mean? I will read a little from the Sanskrit commentary which I have in hand. This is by Sridhar Swami, who wrote about 600, 700 years ago. So he introduces this verse by saying, the Sanskrit first, Ataha samyak chitta shuddhyattam jnana utpatti pariyantam varnashrama uchitani karmani kattabhyani. He says, one should perform one's duties. One should perform action. What action? What are one's duties? Prescribe what is in front of you. The, what words he uses are varnashrama uchitani, appropriate for one's own position in life. You know, in ancient Indian society, society was uh, very uh, stratified, hierarchically divided into castes and stages of life. Uh, the four stages of life, youth, a student, then grihastha, um, a householder, then vanaprastha, one who has retired from life. And then retired from life means not dead, <laughs> retired from the activities of samsara. So when you, when you retire, nowadays, especially in New York, nobody retires, you know, so... <laughs> Vanaprastha literally means the forest, the one who has set off for the forest. And then sannyasa, one who gives up uh, samsara altogether and becomes a monk or a nun. So these are the four stages of life. And they're all meant ulti ultimately for achievement of enlightenment. And then there are the, there are the four traditional castes, um, the priestly uh, class, the Brahm Brahmins, the warriors, the kshatriyas, the commercial class, the vaishyas, and the laborers, the shudras. So the very broad division. And so at any time in this kind of a very rigid social setup, you would, you would find yourself in one of this. It's like a matrix. So either you are a brahmin brahmachari. That means you are a student and you belong to the caste of brahmins. Therefore you have certain things to do. Or you are a Kshatriya householder. For example, Arjun and Krishna, both of them are of the warrior class and both of them are householders. So, according to that, they have certain duties. All that was fine earlier, but doesn't have much meaning in 21st century in Manhattan uh, or even in India today. The old order is God. Uh, but what it simply means is what's, it, what's in front of you in our own lives. So you have a career, you have um, a spouse and kids and family to take care of and a house to maintain, your own health, your own finances. This is your battlefield. There's an option. I could give it all up, all up, tell the kids, tell your spouse, I'm not picking them up. Or you want me to pick them up? Yes, from now on, because I'm off to the Himalayas. <laughs> this is goodbye. I'm not coming back. I've got my visa, for Indian visa, I'm not coming back here. And so goodbye to all that. I've turned in my papers at the job and that's it. Now, that's not as funny as it sounds because a lot of people, when they become very interested in spiritual life, genuinely a spiritual seeking starts, they tend to he head for the high mountains, for the high Himalayas. Um, so that's all right. But Krishna is not in favor of that. That's what Arjuna wanted to do. Remember, Arjuna came fully ready to fight this battle. And then he changed his mind. He said it's not worth it. Worth it in what sense? Worth it in the sense of worldly gain or loss. And then Krishna tells him about Vedanta. And Arjuna says, that's even better. This is really great. I will now dedicate the rest of my life to this. And I'm off to the mountains. You fight your war. That's it. You can take my sword too. <laughs> and my bow and arrow too. I actually did that, you know, I, not a sword or a bow and arrow. When I became a monk, I had a bicycle, which was a fancy one for those days. Um, so one of my close friends who knew that I'm going to become a monk, he said, that's great. Can I have your bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> I said, sure, you can take it. I don't need it anymore. Um, No. Sri Krishna says, rather than doing that, what's in front of you? The battlefield, the battle you are faced with, your battle of life. It's better to do that and there is a way of doing it, which will help you. Why would you do that? Chitta shuddhyartham. 
for purification of the mind. For purification of the mind, for, for preparing the mind for enlightenment. Up to how long? How long should I do that? Jnana utpatti pariyantam. Until the arising of enlightenment. Up to that. Until you get the result you are seeking for. Karmani kattabhyani. Action should be performed. And what action he's already said. It's very clear. If not, suppose I say, Oh, I don't care. I'm off to the mountains anyway. Anyata chitta shuddhi abhavena jnana anutpatte. Because otherwise, in the absence of proper preparation of mind, in the absence of purity of mind, and that goes with absence of concentration of mind, focus of mind, jnana anutpatti, enlightenment will not arise. So what you are going off for, that will not happen. Yes. Purify the mind is, we have conditioning in our mind. This lifetime, and if you have a Vedantic mindset, then many lifetimes of conditioning. Basically, these sense pleasures will make me happy. And so I have been pursuing them, enjoying them, and so the mind has been colored. And when you try to convert, try to focus the mind on Vedanta, your mind won't do that. We think, it's my mind. It's going to do whatever I want it to do. Oh, no, no, no. You are not up to, up to speed <laughs> with what's happening in your own house. It's not really your mind. You lost control of it ages ago. So Swami Prabhavananda Ji gives a very nice example. He is commenting on, um, you know, Christ's Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they, sh they shall see God. Look, it's exactly what we are talking about here. When Christ says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is what is meant here. Blessed are those who have purified their minds, for they will be enlightened. Now, what does it mean? Swami Prabhavanandji, when explaining that, he gives an answer exactly to this question. Practically, what does this impurity of the mind and purity of the mind, what does it mean really? It means this. He says, just now, Try this. Take a look at the picture of Sri Ramakrishna maybe or your Ishta Devata, your chosen deity, whichever form you like of God, Christ or Krishna. And then mentally try to imagine and decide for the next five minutes I shall think of only God, only Sri Ramakrishna or only Krishna. In my heart here I shall focus and I shall meditate. A simple deity, deity visualization practice. Many of us are initiated in a mantra. We do that. In many traditions, similar things are there. But what Prabhavanji is after is something different. He says, try it. Fixed time, only five minutes. Fixed object, the, the form of your deity. I'm thinking about it. And I have decided, my mind will talk about, think about it. Within not even minutes. If you try it now, within seconds you will find all sorts of other th thoughts are intruding. Within seconds. And then you have to bring your mind back to the object of meditation. It might even be minutes after you realize, oh, I, I didn't think about it. I thought about so many other things I was supposed to meditate. What happened? It's because of our past conditioning, our vasanas, desires um, stored up in our mind, they bubble forth. And they remove the particular thought we want to think about. Notice how easy it is to think about things which you like and you desire. And it is even more easy to think of things which you fear and you're scared of. You're helplessly hooked there. Now when you consciously want to think of something, and at the beginning of our spiritual lives, the tremendous desire for God realization, it, most people are not um, lucky enough, blessed enough to have it. We have some desire. We have some desire for enlightenment. But that's not enough. All the past conditioning will bubble forth and sweep that practice out of the mind. That is impurity of mind. As we practice spiritual disciplines, what will happen is, those desires, are, those conditionings are slowly erased and replaced with, with a more positive conditioning, which is conducive to our spiritual practice. There is a story of a Zen student who goes to the master to learn Zen meditation. And he is told to sit and observe the breath and observe what goes on in the mind. And the student says, I can't do it, Master. Why not? Because all sorts of dark, negative 
unpleasant thoughts boil up in the mind. You know, people say, Swami, when I was not meditating, I was fine. Now I'm meditating, my mind is so awful. <laughs> it's not that the mind has become awful when you're meditating. Is there a seat here? Free, yeah. Rather, those thoughts were always there. That conditioning was always there. When we are very busy with the world, we do not see what's in there, what's in our minds. We only become aware of it when we calm down and sit quietly. It comes up. If you have tried it, you will know it comes up. So the Zen student says, it's awful, very difficult to meditate, O Master. Bad thoughts come up in my mind. The Master says, just keep watching. Don't be upset. And here is a bowl of, you know, in the Japanese garden, you have the smooth pebbles. So there are white pebbles and black pebbles. And there is an empty bowl. And when you have a negative thought, pick up a black pebble and put it in that empty bowl. When you have a thought which is positive and calm and relaxed, take up that one and put white pebble and put it in the empty bowl and practice this one hour, two hours a day, every day. And so when that student started at the beginning of his practice the, the bowl would be would slowly fill up mostly with black pebbles and one or two white pebbles negative patterns of thinking but over time as he persisted he began to see the white pebbles incre increasing and the dark pebbles decreasing so the negative thoughts began to diminish and the positive thoughts began to increase till it was more or less not completely uh, positive but more or less, much better. What has happened? The conditioning of the mind has changed. And there's a technique to do this but uh, in meditation. But what Krishna is saying, meditation for one or two or three hours in a day is fine. But what we do in the rest of our life, that is very important. And there is where, that's where karma yoga comes in. Karma yoga changes the conditioning of the mind, makes it purer. Unselfish work, Work done with our body and mind for selfish purposes conditions the mind deeply. Unselfish work reverses that conditioning, makes the mind lighter, freer. Does this answer your question? Yes. What, what is, so the impurity of mind prevents you from practicing spiritual disciplines. And karma yoga increases the purity of the mind and therefore it's basically a moral and ethical lifestyle in and what you are doing already, not abandoning it and uh, trying, trying out something new. All right. You will see that this is the basic teaching of all religions. So this is the foundation, the groundwork. This has to be laid. I can't live a very high pressure, uh, anxiety ridden life and then um, on weekends spend it all weekend partying and then just 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night I should be in Samadhi. No. <laughs> Won't work. Won't work. The monkey mind has been allowed to do what it wants all day long, all week long. And for 10 minutes when you sit down for meditation and tell the mind, now think about God. The mind will say, why should I? I don't want to. So that, that is the sign of impurity of mind. To some degree we all have it. The very fact that there is resistance to spiritual practice. That we do not take to the thought of God like the great saints of different traditions. We don't take it. It's not easy for us. Why? There's, it's not the problem. no problem with religion, no problem with God. It's just us. And there's nothing to be disheartened about at all. It's just the work that has to be done. Inner work. So the commentator says, Naishkarmiyam, the word Naishkarmiyam means actionless state. The, his uh, translation is Naishkarmiyam Jnanam, enlightenment, realization. Why is realization called uh, the, the actionless state? Because when the enlightenment means you realize that you are this one existence consciousness place. And the whole of life Samsara, body, mind, all of these are appearances, like a dream in that consciousness. This is what you begin to see, not theoretically, as a fact. Not that it becomes like that, you'll realize it has always been so, I didn't know that. 
when you wake up from a dream, you had a dream, you're working really, really hard to meet your deadline. You're a student and your teacher has given you lots of readings and you're working, you, you worked hard and you fell asleep and in your sleep also you dreamt how hard you are working. And in the morning, when you get up, do you think I finished my readings? I worked so hard. I met my deadline. No. All the work that you did in your dream is not to be counted. Because you didn't do it at all. Why not? It was an appearance. It's, it's not really done. Similarly, that is actually the truth. Once one becomes enlightened, then all the work that, that goes on, all the activities of samsara, they appear dreamlike to you. You as witness consciousness, you as existence consciousness bliss, you are not touched at all. This is one way of looking at it. Or the other way. It may sound contrary. The other way is, all of action and all the work that you do and all the people that you are involved with and all the samsara, all of it is the absolute. It is Brahman. We chant before food, Brahma arpanam Brahma vi Brahma agno Brahmana utam Brahmevate nagantavyam Brahma karma samadhina By the one who sees Brahman in every action, that one will, will attain to Brahman, means will be enlightened. The one who sees the absolute in every action. That means all the work that we do, religious work, religious action, secular action, worldly action, all of that is nothing other than Brahman. It is all pervaded by God through and through. Now, I've just said two things. They sound absolutely contradictory. One is that action is unreal. It's like a dream for the enlightened person. Or action is nothing other than God, Brahman itself, for the enlightened person. And both of them are actually the same thing. I remember one great teacher in Haridwar saying, saying something like this and then looking at us and smiling. Absolutely contradictory. Brahman is further than the farthest and nearer than the nearest. Brahman is greater than the greatest and smaller than the smallest. Then he looked at us and he said, Well, monks, when you can clearly understand two completely contradictory things at the same time, you have understood Advaita. In Hindi he said, Do virudh bhat ek saath pakad mein aaye to advait pakad mein aa jayega Mahatma ji. Two absolutely contradictory things. And not that you, you say, oh that's really cool. Brahman must be a really cool thing. To be greater than the greatest and smaller than the smallest, farther than the farthest. It moves and it moves not. No, no, it's not just meant to be paradoxical and cool. It's meant to be, it's when, for the person who understands Advaita, it's absolutely clear. It, there is no problem at all in this. One sees very clearly. It moves and it moves not. Think about it. When you dream, you traveled from here to maybe um, Paris. And you came back. And you woke up in your bed. Now, is it true to say that you moved and you moved not? It is true. In one sense, yes. You experienced so much traveling. And in another sense, of course not. Nothing happened. Both are true. Yeah. So, naishkarmiyam, the actionless state, is enlightenment. This is from Advaita perspective. You can consider it all maya, all action, and the results of action are all maya. The entire um, law of karma. What is the law of karma? Good action leads to merit, leads to happiness. Dharma leads... Leads to punya, punya leads to sukha. Deliberately naughty leads to demerit, leads to unhappiness. Adharma leads to uh, papa, papa leads to dukkha. So this is the law of action. Somebody asked a Vedanta teacher, so many books are written about the secret of happiness. How do I be? Ha how can I be happy? It's simple. The law of karma tells you dharma leads to happiness. Good karma leads to happiness. Dharma generates good karma. Good karma leads to happiness. Deliberately done naughtiness generates bad karma and that leads to misery. That's it. That's it. The problem of happiness is solved. Continuously keep doing, saying and thinking what you, what you know to be good right now. Continuously stay away from, consciously make an effort 
to stay away from what your own conscience tells you is not good. Don't do that. Don't think of that. Don't speak about it. That is good. That is the law of karma. And that's all. Many people become fascinated with the law of karma. Sri Ramakrishna did not approve of it. Law of karma after all is samsara. It is, if you know the law of karma, it's like, a, it's like being in the samsara, but wisely so. Yes. What did you mean by saying Ramakrishna did not approve? He did not approve of it. When somebody talked about something about in the gospel of Ramakrishna, you find, it's it, not that he did not approve the law of karma. He did not approve of spiritual seekers being too interested in that. Somebody said, um, some such thing is happening. It's, oh, it's that person's karma. And Sri Ramakrishna looks at him and says, Oh, I mean, to me, oh, little look. I, you belong to that class of people. Those who calculate karma, good and bad. They are fascinated by it. Um, so cause and effect. Action and consequence. It's a natural fascination for us. So this is what is determining my life. Now what do I do to make my life better? And also anxiety. Oh God, I don't know what I did in my past lives. What's going to come? What's rushing at me through the highways of karma to hit me tomorrow? <laughs> I'm scared of it. No. Whether you are jnani or bhakta, devotee of God or a person who is in, in the path of knowledge, Advaita Vedanta. In both cases, the whole point is to transcend this law of karma. Whatever is my past karma, I offer it unto the Lord. I shall, we'll see what, what is to be done. And whatever I am doing now, I shall do it as a worship of the Lord. That's a devotee's approach. A jnani's approach is, the whole thing is like a dream anyway. It's an appearance in my consciousness. <coughs> or the whole thing is Brahman. In that case, good and bad, I don't make a difference. Uh, happy and unhappy from, for me, I'm serene in both. Why I brought this up is, I talked about the law of karma in, in some detail, just a short thing, which was put up on YouTube. And I looked up on which are the most popular talks. Right now, this law of karma, which I consider absolutely unimportant, I mean, it's not unimportant, but it's not, not something that a spiritual seeker should focus on. Just keep an eye on it that the law of karma works, is working for you and that's it. But that's not your spiritual practice. That's something you have to get beyond. And that talk is the most, second most popular talk on YouTube now. Which I wouldn't consider important at all. I mean, on our channel, in the Vedanta Society channel. I think the first one is um, no mind or something or the ultimate truth something to do with Mandukya Karika which is very good somebody is interested in Brahman but the second one is the law of karma <laughs> yeah. then he talks about nachas chitta shuddhim vina kritat sanyasana deva jnana shunyat siddhim moksham samadhi gachati prapnoti Without purification of mind, if one does sannyasa, the formal renunciation of all activity and becomes a monk, there will be, he says, jnana shunyad. There will be no, enlightenment will not arise and one does not attain moksha, liberation. So the whole purpose of becoming a monk or giving up worldly activities is to attain liberation. And yet one does not. Krishna says it very, very clear. One more attitude towards karma, I wanted to mention this, is the Sankhyan attitude. Sankhya, the philosophy of Sankhya, divides the entirety of the universe, your life, into two parts. You, the consciousness, and the rest of it is nature, prakriti. Prakriti purusha. You are pure consciousness, immortal. And the rest of it, this universe, your body, even your mind, even the intellect which you are using to understand Sankhya, all of it belongs to nature. It's nature's property. Those apps belong to the company. <laughs> they are not you. Now, where will action fall in this division? Your share or nature's share? Nature's share. You, you are there. Without you, no action is possible. But you are, not, you are neither the actor, nor the action, nor the result of action. All of that belongs to Prakriti. Action has, its action is related to Prakriti. You, the self, 
in a theistic framework, you your relationship is either you can put it this way, either to your higher self or to God. In a devotional framework, your relation is to God. Action is related to samsara, prakriti, samsara. This must be clear. What we normally do is, I not being aware of my real nature, I identify with this body and mind, and I think I am this person, and now I have this power of action, things to do. And I use it to gratify this body and mind. And then I'm caught in the, in the, in the machine of samsara. Why? Because I have put my hand somewhere it does not belong. It, it is prakriti. It is samsara. Action belongs to prakriti. I am trying to catch hold of it and get my desire satisfied with that. Karma yoga says, let action be related to samsara. Let it be for the welfare of others. You connect yourself to God. That's what karma yoga says. Without purification of mind, one cannot give up action. You know what happens if you give up action without purification of mind? If one, say, practically, let's say, runs off to the mountains. I've seen this happening again and again. And you want to sit there and quiet in meditation. First of all, why do you want to do that? It seems very common, for, especially when you seriously become interested in spiritual life. Many people will say, oh, no, no, I, don't, I never felt like doing that. I am really devoted to God, but I am really into my life in samsara. That means you are really into samsara, not into God. <laughs> what you are into is, samsara is important for me, and, but I am so in, uh, interested in religion. Yes, God and religion will help me in samsara. God for my samsara. God to make my life better, not my life for God. Serious spiritual seeking starts when I want God realization, when I want enlightenment. So we are taking the case of a person who wants enlightenment. Why does this one want to give up all activities in the world? Because, first of all, now they don't seem to be related to my um, goal in life, which is enlightenment. Second, there's a trick of the mind. It's actually a desire for, um, you know, relaxation, desire to avoid trouble. The moment, the lucrative part of it, the, the sensual part of it, the reward at the end of that, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which nobody ever gets, woman, that is removed, then I don't feel like doing anything uh, about it anymore. So I've seen, what happens when a person runs off, literally, I've seen so many monks in the mountains when I was there, three consequences are possible. If the mind is already basically sattvic, that person will spend his time or her time in meditation and in scriptural study, in prayer, lead a holy, noble life, mostly. If the mind is rajasic, that person will sit down for meditation but will entertain a lot of other thoughts. If the mind is tamasic, that person will spend time in laziness and sleeping. Just waste, waste time. Inevitably. It does not matter so much on what you have thought about. See this, this decision, I am off to the Himalayas to meditate, that comes from the level of the intellect. This sounds great. You know the, the philosopher who came, Arindam Chakravarti, he says, I have this desire now to retire to the bank of the Ganges and I have a little cottage. And the consul general was here, Indian consul general, he said, maybe the consul general can give me the cottage, he can arrange for a cottage and I'll stay there. So that's the desire to retire um, away from uh, activities. But that's the taken by the intellect. The mind and the subconscious mind which have not been purified yet, when you actually try to do that, they will swing into action. They will say, we, we, I didn't sign, sign on for this program. I want my... Uh, bed tea and my Starbucks and my um, TV or my internet or whatever and, and my parties, all of that I want. I didn't say that I'm going to sit in, the, in, the, in a rocky cave in the cold and sit with eyes closed at eight hours a day and meditate. No. The mind will rebel. That is rajasic. Rajasic. And tamasic is laziness. Even though I decided to come here to the mountains and sit and meditate, I find I'm dozing off the moment I sit. Why? M mind is tamasic, it's full of tamas. 
I remember this funny story, the middle stage, Rajasik. One of our monks, a senior monk, we were the ashram I was in, it was a school with kids, 500 kids. You can imagine, 500 kids. <laughs> so, the Swami said, I need a break once in a while, even from the ashram. Okay, I've taken a break from samsara, <laughs> and I'm taking a break from the ashram. I will go off to the, to the villages. Some of the monks did that. They're outside the city, far away from the city. I will beg for my food, and I will stay maybe one or two days in some old temple or somewhere, or even, even under the tree. And after a, a day or two, I'll come back to the ashram. And he started doing that. Now then we saw, with, he would set off then, not only once a month, but he would set off every weekend, twice a month, thrice a month. And he would have this determined look on his face. He would hop on the rickshaw and go off to the station and then go, we thought, what's going on with him? And then once the senior monk asked him, the monk in charge, what, uh, are you alright? What are you doing there? Are you going more and more often for a break from the school? And he shamefacedly said, well, I've got to confess something to you. What? That village where I went, well, I started a school there. <laughs> I started a school there. Because I saw the little kids, there was no school and I felt bad for them. So I got them together and I told, persuaded the parents to, you know, like a little heart and I started teaching. Well, that's what you're doing here. <laughs> that's the mind. And that's a rajasic mind, a mind which is full of um, things to do, up and doing. Yeah. Then number five. Nahi kashchit kshanam api kashchit kshanam api jato tishthatya karma kret jato tishthatya karma kret karyate hyavasha karma karyate hyavasha karma sarva prakriti jair gune Sarva Prakriti Jair Gune. What does this mean? Here is the problem. Even for a moment you cannot stay with, without work. Some kind of action will go on. In your body, in your mind. You can, even if you say, I want to give it all up and sit in meditation. Even then action is going on. Why? Karyate Hyavasha Karma. You are helplessly you will be engaged in action. Why? Sarva prakriti jair gunai. Because they are, you are, they, are, they are all born of the gunas of prakriti of nature. Nature is ever restless. You look at the universe around you. From the galaxies and the stars up to the tiny particles whirling around the nucleus in the atom. Ever restless. Ever in motion. Continuous change. And our bodies and our minds are all, they belong to you or prakriti. They belong to prakriti, to nature. So they share in the, in the nature of nature. That is continuous change. So action is continuously going on in the body. You cannot say, if I'm sitting still, there's no action. Of course there is action going on. If I try to keep quiet, mind will be active. So you notice this fact about your own nature, O Arjuna. You cannot stay even for a moment without action. If this is true... If this is true, then the wise person will not make a fool's attempt to stay without any action. This is not possible. Rather, these energies are flowing through me. Prana is flowing through me. I must channelize it. If there is a particular thing I want, want, like the way I pursued what I wanted in the world, now I want to pursue enlightenment, let me channelize my uh, energies towards enlightenment. A wise person will do that, instead of trying to stop everything altogether. Uh, the Sanskrit commentator makes an important point. Karmanam cha sannyasaha teshu anasakti matram natu swarupena ashakyatvat. What does giving up action mean? Karmanam to sannyasa. Sannyasa means giving up, renunciation. So a sannyasi is a monk who has given up. Uh, what is giving up action? What does it mean? He says, teshu anasakti matram, just being detached from them. Not using them to fulfill worldly desires. 
that is giving up action natu swarupena not actually stopping action not just becoming a statue sitting still why not ashakyatvat because it's impossible it's just impossible many people find it difficult to sit still that's bad you must learn how to sit still swami shankaranand ji was a president of our order long before my time uh by all accounts a formidable really formidable monk and um by all accounts he was huge and he was very fair now and he would be very very still when he would sit even his eyes he wouldn't blink now those who have gone to the temple of sri ramakrishna in, in belur mat you would have seen the statue of sri ramakrishna is a white marble statue which of course being a statue sits still <laughs> and the tradition is you go to the temple bow down to the uh, image of sri ramakrishna then go uh, to the head of the order the president of the order and offer your pranams your salutations to the president of the order now it so happened this was in the 1950s swami shankaranand ji was president and this mother and a little little child a little boy so they had obviously come to the main temple and they had bowed down there and then they came to the president maharaj the, the head of the order and while they were bowing down the little boy he looked carefully at the swami this huge person so white you know fair unblinking and moving absolutely still sitting like that and he looked very carefully and crept up before anybody could do anything he crept up to the swami and the swami's thigh he did this and the swami it seems he had a cavernous voice a, like a booming voice um, a, a person well my grandmother she was a disciple of that swami so she told me it said whenever my guru spoke to me it seems as if his voice is coming out of a cave <laughs> you know <laughs> so suddenly the swami looked down at the little boy and he said not a statue <laughs> and the boy was so startled he rushed and hid behind his mother's sari you know little, little peeked out from behind his mother <laughs> in bengali he said statue noy <laughs> because he understood the little boy psychology that he, the boy must have gone to the temple and seen the statue of sri ramakrishna and then come here and looking at this thinking this one is also like that <laughs> uh, yes one must learn how to sit still and there are many many really i mean it's not related right here it's related to meditation people say my mind uh, is doesn't settle down in meditation wanders here and there there are different ways when the breath is calm mind is calm when the eyes are fixed the mind is fixed when the body is still the mind is still sharir drishti pran sthairya and this is a, a teacher told me i read about it um in uttarakhand what does it mean one way of making the mind still is making the body still sit still don't not rigid if you sit rigid after some time the muscles will become tired and then you'll have to move so relaxed but don't fidget be aware that you are really really still one way is this is the buddhist idea Imagine you are holding a bowl of water, and the water is full to the brim, absolutely full to the brim. Even if your hand trembles a little, a few drops will spill over. So imagine how carefully you have to hold, and how much attention you have to put there if you don't want to spill even a little of the water. Now imagine your mind is that bowl. So how carefully you have to sit so that there is no any shaking of the body, the mind will be disturbed, like that bowl of water. keep that strongly in your mind that image of the bowl of water and the water filled to the brim little trembling of your hand it will spill similarly a little trembling of the body okay. sit another way these are meditation masters they have they have investigated this so much over the centuries and millennia see there is one way of giving instructions 
You sit straight and relax, don't be uh, rigid, but don't be bent over. Keep the spine and the neck and the waist in one line. This is, these are what are called linear instructions. One, two, three, four, five, six, like a drill sergeant. It works. That's one way. Another way is shortcut, bypass the intellectual mind, go straight to the subconscious. You know what they say? Sit like a mountain, breathe like the wind. Whatever that means, your subconscious mind knows. How does the mountain sit? Just think if you imagine that, you are, the mount you are not you anymore, you are the mountain. That's the power of the subconscious mind. You'll see immediately the sitting becomes much better. Or another way, imitatio, in, in Latin it is called. Uh, in um, yoga also it is used. Take the example of a yogi, Vivekananda. He's sitting here. Perfect. This is a Raja Yoga posture, meditation posture. Now, if you know something about Vivekananda, it will work better that way. If you read about Vivekananda, you know about him, how he's in Samadhi. Imagine now when you're sitting, it's not I who am sitting. I'm gone now. It's Vivekananda is sitting. How is Vivekananda sitting? What are the thoughts in the mind of Vivekananda? Subconscious mind. Of course, it's still you. But your subconscious kicks into action. What happens is, I am meditating. And your subconscious mind says, hey, you, I know you, you can't meditate. <laughs> your mind is going to be disturbed. And your mind becomes disturbed. Because it's your mind, I, my mind cannot be but disturbed. So it's going to be disturbed. But if you tell the subconscious, not me, it's Vivekananda. And subconscious says, ah, Vivekananda, of course, he's a great meditator. Now you, you have, your meditation is very deep now. And your meditation will be deep. You can try it and see. Especially if it's somebody you know. Some people get scared. Isn't it blasphemous to think of myself as Krishna or Jesus? In fact, one of the novices went to the, uh, his guru. I remember he told me later. He said, can I think of myself as Sri Ramakrishna? And uh, I was a teacher. So I said, I, I can't say that. You have to ask your guru. Is it, is it a good thing to think? And his guru told him, yes. He looked at him carefully. But it's a specific instruction to that person. You can do that. Meditation becomes immensely deep. Immediately. Effortlessly so. Anyway, that's uh, beside the point here. The point here is, you cannot stay for even a moment without action. Suppose you try. Suppose you try, in spite of all of these warnings, suppose you, and I've seen so many, many who try. Disaster. When you try very hard, what happens? You know, stubbornly. No. The Swami is telling us all this, but he's a monk. So I'm going to become a monk, no matter what he tells. I'm going to become a monk and I'll show him. I'll go to the highest cave in the highest mountain and I'll meditate. What will happen? Sixth verse. Karmindriyani sangyamya Karmindriyani sangyamya Ya aste manasasmaran Ya aste manasasmaran Indriyarthan vimuratma Indriyarthan vimuratma Mithyachara saujyate Mithyachara saujyate A strong warning. He says that deluded person Vimuratma deluded person or the fool who forcibly controls the external organs. I will not walk and talk. I will not um, turn up for my job or uh, pick up the kids. I'm going to sit quietly and meditate. And then internally what's going on? Outwardly sitting quietly, eyes closed, even still, huh? sitting like the mountain. <laughs> internally what's going on? Indriyarthan manasasmaranaste. Mind is continually dwelling on the world, on things of the senses. Oh, I want that, would be nice. That movie is very nice. Can I get a ticket for that? That person, I think, wants to insult me. Well, wait a minute. When I, tomorrow I go back, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> Meditation going on, on God. <laughs> <laughs> then what? And the, it's, the Krishna is particularly harsh. Mithyachara sauchyate, that one is called a hypocrite. 
mithyachara the one who acts inauthentically a hypocrite i want to meditate on god or i want to stabilize in the knowledge that i am the witness and i'm doing anything but that so for large periods of time it can happen and i've seen it and those who force it even further nervous breakdown i've seen they, they lose their mind i've unfortunately i've seen in the case of a few who do much more than what they actually should be doing hours and hours of meditation not enough sleep not enough food why one senior monk used to joke a wonderful old swami he used to joke that ah because i will get enlightenment first and win the first prize <laughs> but that's the childish <laughs> mentality we have we don't put it that way so in such a silly way but i want enlightenment right now i'm going to be the buddha right now <laughs> nervous breakdown i've seen people go- literally going up their mind forcibly what happens is it awakens maybe some scars of this life or even past lives and you are not ready to deal with it like demons being awakened i literally saw one young monk not a monk a novice kill himself in front of my eyes i didn't know he just suddenly ran past me i was bowing down in the temple i saw this person running and then he takes a jump into the river and i thought maybe he's going to take a bath because that's where people were taking bath and they didn't realize until they saw he was not coming up and when they went to see gone and then they asked what happened they had been meditating day and night and suddenly he thinks he's enlightened all sleep is gone all these such things happen but it's it's pathological it's pathological it's a, it's a nervous breakdown and i've seen other other cases too overdoing never good never good especially these uh, uh, subtle spiritual practices they have an effect they have a very powerful effect if we cannot handle it yes uh you mentioned what that so that actually brings up a very good question yes Yes. That is true. Um no rules for avatars. Avatars are basically incarnations of God. So these are extraordinary. You will see the founders of the religions are those who are at the source of spiritual traditions. One has to admit people have different capacities. And one has to be honest about it. When I look at myself, my physical capacities, my mental capacities, my intellectual capacities and therefore my sp- capacity for spiritual practice is very different from many others the people who are much stronger than me physically who cannot who can deny that there are people who are much smarter than me intellectually there are people who are much deeper spiritually i have seen it i have been teaching novices for 8 9 years and i could see these young novices who have just become monks 2 or 3 years ago and i have been a monk for 10 or 12 years and there are other senior monks who have been monks for 20 30 40 years and these maybe one or two in each group of novices maybe 30 40 novices maybe one or two are exceptionally developed that comes from past lives so the kind of meditation that they can do is difficult for others to do so there are different capacities and the capacities of the avatars are extraordinary they are not here to attain enlightenment they are here to teach us so you will find what they do in two years or one year or three years or 9 or 8 or 9 years in case of buddha it may take lifetimes for the others to come even close to that you take one day in the life of sri ramakrishna is going in and out of samadhi so many times and once maybe a, a, a spiritual seeker can attain that kind of a spiritual uh, absorption maybe once or twice in his lifetime so one must admit different capacities just as there are different capacities in our practical day to day life you know physical capacity mental capacity they're different and there's nothing wrong in that it's perfectly all right one should start where one is yeah. even the buddha in fact last week was buddha's birthday <laughs> thrice blessed day and i just happened to be at the un at that time and uh, just showing a swami had was visiting showing him around and in one of the halls um there was theresa may 
the British Prime Minister, she was giving a talk on mindfulness. Yes. And she was not there physically. It was a video link from London. So they were celebrating Buddha's birthday. Maybe she needs mindfulness now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So capacities are different, no doubt about it. Yes. Please sit here, sir. Sit, please sit here. Yes. What prevented us from being conscious of our own consciousness? Well, true, true. Now the problem is, we are ignorant of our, of our real self. Why are we ignorant, if you ask? In Uttarakhand, sadhus they have a very nice answer to this. He says, Agyan ko, Agyan ko pratishthit mat ki jiye, Mahatma ji, Agyan ko kaatiye. Don't try to establish ignorance, try to remove ignorance. The point is, there are answers to that. There are answers to that question. But, right now the practical answer is, if this is true, the what do I need to do now? Not to go on a theoretical quest on how it all began, rather to get out of this problem. Right? So, um, yes, we are pure consciousness. We are the Atman, Brahman, whatever you call it. We don't know it now, we don't feel it now. But enlightened people assure us it is possible. The teachings of the great religious traditions, they all assure us in different language, in different, different systems. And that's what we should pursue. If you ask, I have discussed this question, those who are here, I have discussed this number of times. How did it all begin? Or uh, one answer in Vedanta is Maya. If you say, why Maya? Then you know my answer. The question why cannot be asked there. Why can the question why cannot be asked there? Then uh, that it leads to a subtle discussion of causality. And so on. So the straight answer to your question is, such a situation exists. Now I must get out of it. That would have been Buddha's answer also. Why I brought up Buddha was two reasons. One, you asked about meditation and capacities. He did an extremely hard practice. Nearly died as a result of it. And then what did he come to the conclusion? The middle path. The middle path. Not luxury and looseness and, and uh, dissolution, dissolute life. No. Not this torturing the body. There are so many yogis in India especially who do that. Ascetics tend to do that. Some of the desert fathers in early Christianity they used to do that. Torturing the body. That also is not helpful. Because if the instrument is damaged... The Buddha gave the example of the veena. He said, oh monks, if the strings of the veena are loose, will you have music? No. If you tighten it too hard, what will happen? It will snap. It has to be just so. Of course, his middle path was a pretty austere middle path. We would consider it pretty extreme if you actually read about what he wants us to do. Yes, a follow-up? Yes. Yes. Okay, when it comes back. No. In, the, in the pure consciousness, hmm. when, uh, pure consciousness you mentioned in the witness. Yes. Hmm. Is that witness consciousness part of ego or part of Atma, Brahman? Ah. Many uh, Vedantists here eager to answer. Me, me, let me answer. <laughs> so, witness consciousness is part of ego or part of uh, Atman? Atman. Atman. Yes. <laughs> witness consciousness is part of Atman, but part is also not the not the correct word. It is the Atman. It is the Atman. If you say part of it, part of Brahman, that leads to Vishishta Advaita. Advaita Vedanta says, Sakshi Chaitanya, the witness consciousness. It's not a consciousness which witnesses, not as an act. I'm sitting here and witnessing consciousness, you know, like with a telescope or something, witnessing something. No, not like that. It just is and it shines. Sat Chit. And in its light, everything is revealed. That which is revealed, if you take it to be a separate existence, universe, body, mind, they are all separate, real, out there, and you are the uninvolved witness consciousness. What is this philosophy called? Sankhya. Sankhya. Okay. <laughs> but if you say, all of that is an appearance in you, the witness consciousness, like, you, like um, things which you are experienced in a dream. What you experience in a dream is not out there. It was in your mind. Now, in Brahman, if all of this is appearing not apart from Brahman, then what would it be? Advaita, Advaita yes. Advaita Vedanta. 
So in that sense, witness consciousness. Yes. One more verse. Oh, let me just read out the one line which the commentator, he has made a very, very nice comments here. This hypocrite who sits and thinks of the world, pretending to meditate. He says, in the guise of meditating on God, sits there, thinks about the things of the world. Why? Because of impurities of mind. Remember, he wants to meditate on God. He really doesn't want to think about, he does not want to meditate on, on his boss or uh, um, uh, on uh, whether parking has to be re renewed or something like that. He doesn't, not, doesn't want to, but automatically it comes up. Why? Because of impurity of mind. And what is, does this lead to? Instability. You are not stable in the meditation on the deity, if you are meditating on Krishna, or on the self, the capital S. You can't stay there as the witness. People keep saying, it was there for half an hour. So, God was there for half an hour? The, the absolute, beyond time, space and causation was there for half an hour? No. The mind sort of settled down on it and then... Let me read out the Sanskrit. Bhagavad Dhyana Chalena. Chala means pretending to be. Bhagavad Dhyana Chalena Indriyarthan Vishayan Smaran Aste Aste sits Smaran thinking of things of the world. Why? Avishuddha Taya Manasa Because of impurity of the mind. Not yet purified. Then the result is Atmani Sthairiya Bhavat Lack of stability in the Atman, in the, in the Self. In contrast to this, okay, we've run out of time. Anybody wants to make a comment? Yes. So what's the answer? What's the solution? Solution to? to this situation? To, to uncondition yourself. Ah, oh, right, right. For that, you have to come to the next class. <laughs> I thought I would do more today. The answer is there. Krishna begins to answer from the very next verse. Seventh verse of third chapter. He begins the answer. What should be done? If you cannot come, an executive summary. Nowadays, you know, you don't have to read the book. It seems the secretary will perform, will um, make an executive summary for the boss. <laughs> so that the boss can claim that he has read the book. <laughs> so you can claim that you have read the executive summary. Uh -huh. Therefore, bringing the sense organs under control with the help of the internal organ, mind, intellect, memory, uh, hankara, engage thou in action. Moral action, your action, due, um, that person will attain enlightenment. And he says, Niyatam kuru karmatvam. Be continuously engaged in action, O Arjuna. Why? Karma jaya hi akarmana. Action is better than inaction. As a principle. Because through inaction you don't achieve until en enlightenment. Even the ones who achieve enlightenment and they say that we have achieved the state of no action are not the persons who are not, it's not that they have stopped acting with the body. For them, even while acting intensely, from their point of view there is no action at all. So that all those things will come slowly. Yes. So what happens to a person who is invalid and cannot act? Alright, physically invalid but can think. I remember a monk Two or three examples, very beautiful. One monk who was paralyzed. Hmm. This, um, he had only one hand, use of only one hand. And uh, I, I was in the hospital and he was in the, a couple of beds next to mine. And he could not even feed himself. Others had to do it for him. But throughout the day, whenever he was conscious, often loudly, he's going on, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna. Krishna, 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 like it's, it's going on. Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, it would go on like this. Particularly touching incident. This happened in our hospital. So I, I was a young novice, the youngest of the patients, because I was a little sick, so I was put in the hospital. But it, it, it enabled me to see that ward was full of, it was only for monks. So it was full of old swamis who were ailing, maybe about to die. Some did die. It, it gave me a quick glimpse preview of what's in store for me. 
It's very nice. It's very nice. I, I'm so happy that I got to see that. I was there for nearly two months. And that's one of the things I took away from there. So this Swami, his name was Gold Maharaj. He was, um, he passed away a few weeks after that, few months after that. Anyway, I still remember one beautiful evening. That ward is pretty high, Shiva Patishtan. It's pretty high up on the sixth or seventh floor um, in Calcutta. So and from the windows, that you could just see sort of darkness and the city lights in the distance. Evening, it's all quiet in the hospital. Imagine these are. Of old men who are sick and dying, basically, physically, that's, that's, what, that's the fact on the ground. So this Swami who's lying there, he's been paralyzed for 11 years. 11 years in that state. And another monk, who was my teacher, who had a beautiful singing voice. Um, he is there, near this old Swami's bed. And you know, sometimes for some patients you put up barriers on the bed. So the, the wooden barrier on the bed. Holding that barrier and this Swami is looking out at this old monk who is paralyzed. And he's singing. And there's such a beautiful scene. He's singing. The lines of the song, I've forgotten the original lines, but they, they meant this. Um, imagine the window outside, it's dark. He says, uh, it's a song to the Guru. O oh Guru, O oh my Guru, it is time to go now. Evening has come. Evening has come. But it is so dark and my heart quakes in fear. Hold my hand, O oh Guru. Let us go together. Go together. It's a song of death and passing, you know. So I, I remember that. It was so beautiful, so touching. You know, like the individual hairs on your head. Because his voice was so beautiful. That's one. Unable to act. And the other monks would help. You know, say, Swami, do you remember? Who is that? Will show me a picture of his guru. Do you remember? His guru's picture. And he would say, Guru, Guru. <laughs> do you remember? So that Thakur, Ramakrishna. Yes, I remember. Another monk I knew, who was also paralyzed, a disciple of Swami Vigyanandaji. This is the worst condition. Blind in both eyes. Paralyzed in both legs. And like that, he remained for, I think, 12 to 15 years. I saw him towards the end of his life. And a happier man, I, I kid you not, I have not met. A stronger spirit, I have not met. Not once did he, I ever heard him. I was with him in that same uh, dorm, uh, in the hospital ward, for two months nearly consecutively. And later on, in the main monastery, I was to go and see him. Not once have I heard him talk about his own body. If you would go to him, he would be full of cheer because he can't see you. You have to tell him who you are. And then he would inquire. Mostly monks would go to see him. Which ashram you have come from? How is the work going on there? Uh, is everybody keeping well? Please convey my blessings to them. And strong. When he was in the ward, he basically this old paralyzed blind man. He controlled everybody else. We are all running around doing his <laughs> Once, the funny, the Swami in charge of the kitchen he would come and say, Swami, I'm so and so, I'm in charge of the kitchen. Uh, would you like to eat anything special? He said, I want dosa. Because <laughs> his Bengali has hardly had any chance to have dosa. So the Swami said, I'll make dosa for you, don't worry. It'll be specially made for you. The next day he makes it and we watch how it is. It has to be fed to him, he can't eat. After that, the Swami sort of smugly, the kitchen Swami asked, Well, did you like it? How did you like it? And he says, no good. <laughs> what? No good? What do you mean? This, this dosa I had in Mysore. When did you go to Mysore? Oh, there, that the other day, you know, in 1952. <laughs> 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 and this other Swami goes, Swami, that was before I was born. <laughs> he says, it's not like that dosa. <laughs> <laughs> full of him. And, and incredible. Um, It taught me, I'll really tell you, it taught me what it means to be bodiless. To, be bo to, be, to transcend the body does not mean like coming out like a puff of smoke out of the body and floating away. No, it means to be in the body and entirely unaffected by the body. What it means to be unaffected by your circumstances of life. Okay, this Swami, he was one of the most active Swamis. He was well known in our Ramakrishna mission, Narendrapur. He was there. 
he was the one in charge of the gardens the agriculture and the maintenance of the buildings which is a huge huge job he was busy from morning till night this swami imagine laid flat for 12 or 15 years i don't know how long cannot see cannot move real real um, i could tell on those two months gave me so many stories i can share one day in the evening uh, just monks you know and the swami is around 6:30 or so uh, other monks have come the hospital is run by the monks so they come to visit the patients who are monks and we would sort of ch- chat and gossip a little and it's evening the swami can't see that it's evening he, he's blind he's in the corner and we are talking and sort of gossiping and he had a very strong voice from there he shouts oh monks the evening comes time to meditate stop chatting and we would all sort of quieten down and sort of <laughs> get 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 back to meditating can you imagine half a dozen maybe more than that 10 old swamis who have had operations with different kinds of serious illnesses i was the young one others were all old not much chance of getting much better little better little worse and then die evenings mornings how they are all sitting on the bed say straight meditating the whole uh, ward that particular ward has that atmosphere of a meditation hall amazing it's really worth seeing that spiritual life really can transform your our lives hold on to it seriously for a lifetime it transforms your life on that beautiful note let us end Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu